start. So today we continue with uh, dynamic programming. Um, and we consider the following problem. So uh, you have a factory that has two assembly lines, OK? Um, and they are almost identical <coughs> in the sense that the sequence of uh, workstations on that assembly line perform the same tasks both for the, uh, for the, on the first assembly line and on the second assembly line. So this workstation here does exactly the same job as this workstation here. However, the equipment was not uh, bought all of the, on the same, at the same time, and maybe some, uh, some workstations have been replaced. So the assembly time for the same operation at a workstation on the first assembly line might be different than the uh, assembly time for the, exactly the same task that takes on the second assembly line, right? So you have a choice uh, whether you, uh, whether a particular stage of assembly of your product uh, um, will be done on the first, on the second line, regardless of where you start, because uh, it is possible to move a product from the first assembly line to move it to the second assembly line for the next stage. And similarly, for the second assembly line, if uh, your product has uh, done has been assembled up to stage k here you can either proceed on the same assembly line without any delay but if you decide to choose to change the assembly line then there is a transportation cost a certain amount of time that takes to move the product from one assembly line to another assembly line and uh, in the very beginning, uh, uh, you, you know, your completely unfinished products are stored in a warehouse and then it might take uh, a different amount of time to bring the product to the beginning of the first uh, or to the beginning of the second assembly line because maybe assembly lines are not in the same buildings, right? And then similarly, once the assembly of the product is uh, uh, completed, uh, it might take different uh, amount of time to move the product from the assembly line uh, back to the warehouse, right? Now, <clears throat> the problem that you are facing is the following. Assume that you have to fulfill some urgent job, right? So you want to assemble it uh, as quickly as possible using as little time as uh, possible, and you have to decide which stages of the assembly will take uh, place on the first assembly line and which stages of assembly will take uh, on the second um, assembly line. So the dotted line here shows one possible path. If you start on the second assembly line, then you move to the first assembly line, incurring this extra cost. Then from here, you move back to the second assembly line, continue on the second assembly line, again go to the first assembly line, and so forth. If you did exhaustive an exhaustive search, how, much, uh, how, uh, how many combinations do you have to check um, if you want to find the smallest amount of time, right? You would simply total this time, plus time for assembly here, plus time for transportation, time for assembly, and so forth. How many different paths through the factory for a product are there? If you have N workstations. It is what? Uh, why four, why not two? Well, uh, well, once you are at a certain assembly line, you have two choices. Either you move to the uh, next 
or you go straight uh, on the same assembly line. So there are only two choices. There are four um, uh, lines here, but uh, uh, if you are here, if you've done previous task here, you have only two options. Either you go straight here or you change. So after you complete a task, you have only two options, change the line, the assembly line, or um, uh, stay on the same assembly line, right? So it, there are two to the N um, choices. You can say uh, if a task is done on the top, uh, assembly line, you will put zero at the uh, height uh, position of a sequence of n zeros and uh, ones. Or, and if you are doing the same task on the second assembly line, you put one. So obviously then the total number is uh, the total is just the number of binary uh, numbers uh, uh, that have exactly n uh, bits. So exhaustive search is exponential in the number of workstations, so it's infeasible. So our job is to find a feasible solution. Now this example looks uh, maybe not terribly exciting, right? Um, uh, but uh, actually this is an extremely important algorithm because uh, uh, the idea that we use here is the same idea that is used in something called Viterbi decoder. That is crucial, for example, in speech recognition. Uh, you know different probabilities for each phonemes, and uh, um, for different uh, correct phonemes, you have different probabilities how you can interpret them. Some phonemes are very similar to each other, so you may easily um, misidentify, and uh, uh, finding the most likely uh, uh, word uh, or a sequence of phonemes uh, essentially is done by uh, this uh, so-called uh, Viterbi decoder, and the idea is exactly the same as the idea how we compute this minimal uh, time processing in the factory, but uh, just in a simpler context uh, to uh, to follow. So this is really uh, quite an important methodology here. Okay, so uh, what is now the, um, the idea behind uh, the algorithm, right? Uh, assume, so what do you think, what will be the sub-problems that we are going to solve in the course of dynamic programming? what's natural to consider. Again, using the very same trick in which we impose a restriction on, uh, uh, on the solutions of the same. You remember, for example, for maximal increasing subsequence, we looked for the maximal in increasing subsequence that ends precisely with the i-th number. So something similar will be used here. What do you think? What will be the sub-problems with such a similar restriction? It will be uh, for every i. So if we have workstations uh, from 1 all the way to n, what we are going to find is uh, for every i, uh, we will find uh, shortest possible path through the factory, through first I many tasks of, the, uh, of assembly, so that um, the last task is uh, done on first assembly line, and in parallel, simultaneously, we will evaluate, we will find the shortest possible path through the factory, among all the paths to the through the first I uh, assembly tasks with restriction that the very last task is done on the second assembly line, right? So uh, once again, right, we are looking for the shortest path 
through the first i tasks that ends with i task being finished here. And with a parallel recursion, we look also for the same, uh, for the shortest path to the, through the factory, through first i. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I cannot see this with these glasses, so <laughs> we are now, uh, it could be a typo in the, oh, uh, oh, yes, 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 A2, it says A2, it should be A22. Well, guess what software was used to create this brilliant, uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, graphics. Word as well, yeah. So probably it was written A to two, but the text box got uh, uh, chopped. So uh, I would really like to know if you use anything better for sketching diagrams of this. Uh, which? Okay, please send me an email. You get extra credit. <laughs> okay. So what is then the recursion? Just like in the previous uh, uh, dynamic programming problems, uh, we have to find uh, a solution. So you have to choose a problem so that optimal solution for the ith stage can be obtained from optimal solutions for a minus first stage. Okay, so let me ask you a question. Assume that uh, you have an optimal path from the beginning to say i stage uh, on the first assembly line. And assume that this optimal solution uh, came here from the second assembly line. Now if I throw away this node and restrict myself just to this workstation at stage i minus one. Is the, the truncation of the optimal path, uh, optimal path for the problem uh, i minus one with the condition to end uh, on the second assembly line? Yes, the very same cut and paste argument. Assume that there was something better, not the truncation of the path uh, up to i, but something better well, if there was something better ending here, you can use this something better to extend it with the very same cost of transporting up to here uh, and get a better solution for the uh, solution up to i. So this suggests that the recursion uh, will be... Uh, so initially, we have to first initialize um, the uh, minimal time. If you are uh, here, well, there is no choice. It's just the cost of uh, transportation up to here and then the time needed to finish the job here. And similarly, for this node, optimal solution is clearly just the time needed to finish the job, first job here plus this transportation time. So you have this uh, here. And now we have um, recursion. Simply, you consider the previous stage of recursion, and you consider both the optimal solution to end up here and optimal solution to end up here. To optimal solution to end up here, you will add the transportation cost and the cost of finishing the job here, that's one of the uh, choices, right? The other choice is uh, to, uh, for the optimal solution to end up here, you simply add the cost to finish the uh, height operation on this uh, uh, workstation without any transportation uh, costs, right? So these parts, and the same applies, of course, for both uh, upper and the lower workstation. So these are 
uh, minimal times uh, uh, for the upper and minimal times for the lower. And um, so if you don't change, if you continue on the same assembly line one, you simply add this. If you, in the, for the second one, if you continue uh, optimal solution from assembly line two to the very same workstation on the very same line, you only add this. While if you are changing the, uh, the assembly lines, uh, then you will have, notice, optimal solution for the second line, which is here, plus this time here, right, the transportation time, plus the time needed to um, uh, finish the job at this uh, workstation. And similarly here, it's optimal time to finish the I minus first job here, plus the transportation cost, plus the cost to finish the I job here. So you get recursion and this produces correct solution because exactly of uh, the reason that uh, we explain just the simple cut and paste uh, uh, argument verifies that you see that the optimal solution uh, up to stage K is produced only from optimal solutions for both sides, one and two, right, assembly lines, but only optimal solutions up to K minus one. So you don't have to consider all the uh, choices that you might have because uh, uh, the recursion depends uh, uh, sub problems are chosen in such a way that recursion depends only on the previous, uh, for optimal solutions for the previous stages, uh, right? And then uh, after you compute what is the minimal time to end up to finish the job here, you add to it the transportation cost to the warehouse, and similarly to the cost to end up here, you add uh, this transportation cost, and you take the mean of these two uh, values, which is what's on the very, very bottom. So it's really uh, very simple. Once you solve sufficient number of dynamic programming problems, most of the cases uh, you can kind of guess uh, pretty reasonably easily what uh, uh, what the sub-problems should be. So notice what is important here to uh, remember as a part of the strategy. Optimal solutions, uh, you know, the sub-problems have to have this uh, optimal solution sub-problem property. Namely, that optimal solution for a larger sub-problem depends only on optimal solution of smaller sum problems. Maybe several of them, maybe only one, but uh, um, it has to depend only on the optimal solutions for sub problems. And if we store solutions of sub problems in a table, then we compute them only once. Um, so um, this gives the efficiency to dynamic programming because uh, uh, sub-problems can be used in a great deal of uh, uh, constructions for uh, larger uh, sub-problems, as we will see um, more today. Uh, but this is so the recursion, you should always choose the recursion so that optimality of the solutions or at any stage uses only optimal solutions at any stage, uses only optimal solutions for uh, smaller sum problems, uh, uh, not uh, just uh, all solutions for sub problems, but just the optimal ones. And this is the tricky part, uh, which we will see. Uh, sometimes uh, it's easy to make a mistake. We will show, uh, we will work on an example uh, that uh, uh, is actually quite tricky to, it's kind of tempting to uh, to believe that the optimal solution is preserved, where actually it is not. But we will see this uh, in examples to come. Okay. So, any questions about the previous problem? Okay, I hope you are reading the notes uh, at home. Uh, so, now um, a problem 
with matrix multiplication. So you know that uh, product of matrices uh, is an associative operation, right? In the sense that if you have a product of three matrices, it doesn't matter whether you multiply first BC and then you multiply product by A from the left, or uh, you first compute AB and then you multiply by C from the right. So remember, product of matrices is not a com commutative operation. IB, AB is not uh, in general equal to BA, but it is associative. And this is why when you uh, write a product of matrices, you don't have to put brackets, right? Because uh, no matter in what order you perform the multiplication, you will always get the very same answer. But it is not true that it is computationally equally efficient uh, regardless of how you, uh, how you um, group the matrices. In fact, as we will show now, uh, there can be a gigantic difference in complexity if you uh, choose to multiply first BC rather than multiplying first AB. So here is an example. You have three matrices of compatible sizes. So A is 10 by 100. B is 100 by 5, and C is 5 by 50. So notice, so in order to have matrices compatible, the width of the left matrix has to be uh, equal to the height of the right matrix. <clears throat> so now, if you first do A times B, what will be the size of the product? Well, the product inherits the height of the left matrix and uh, the width of the right matrix. So the product of these two matrices will be a matrix of size uh, uh, 10 uh, by, uh, uh, by 5, uh, right? Here it is. So 10 height and 5 the width. And now if you multiply these two matrices, the result will be 10 by 50. Now let's count how many floating point uh, operations we had to do. When you multiply A and B, you multiply each uh, row with uh, each column, right? There are altogether 10 times 5 uh, 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 elements in the product. So the total number of multiplications will be 10 times 5 for each element of the product, uh, one multiplication, right? And what's the size to find each element of the product matrix? Well, this is 100 by 100, so it takes 100 multiplications, right? So um, the result is uh, 5 times, uh, sorry, 10 times 5 plus, uh, sorry, times 100 to get to this point. Right? And then in the second step, you multiply these two matrices. So the, the matrix is 10 times 50, size 10 times 50. And uh, it takes only five computations for each entry, right? Because a row is of size 5 as well as the column, right? So you have 10 times 50 times 5. This is the first product happens to be 5,000, the second 2,500, so 7,500 multiplications, right? Now let's see what happens if we multiply in other order, namely we multiply BC first and then multiply by A uh, from left. Well, if you multiply B times C, the product is 100 times 50, and you can immediately see that uh, this will get us in trouble because this matrix is gigantic, much bigger uh, than any of the matrices that we encounter up here. So um, the product uh, will be, so matrix A remains unchanged. The, the product here is 100 times 50. So we will have 100 times 50 entries times, uh, um, uh, times 100. So in total, as you can see, 
uh, to first uh, um, get uh, this matrix, it's 100 times 50 times 5, right? Because this uh, uh, here multiplication takes only five, uh, uh, five uh, float m multiplications, right? And then on top of it, you have to add uh, the product of A with this product, which will be uh, how many entries do we have? Again, 10 times uh, 50, but here the product will, be, uh, will cost you 100 float uh, multiplication. So you get this factor, and when you sum up this, uh, you end up with 75,000. So notice, multiplying A, B, C uh, takes only one-tenth of the number of, sorry, uh, which one is it? Uh, the, so this one ends up being 10 times more expensive than A, B times C. Now, assume that you have a whole chain of uh, matrices. Again, the same story by associativity. It doesn't matter how you group them. The product matrix will be always the same matrix, right? But as you could have seen, just having three of them produced a, a difference in co time complexity of order 10, right? Tenfolds increase. So you can imagine if you have a longer chain of matrices to multiply, uh, if you group them in, an Im in a suboptimal way, you might end up with something that is almost intractable, that uh, the number of multiplications is gigantic, right? So your task is that if you are given a sequence of matrices, uh, of course you can see uh, their dimensions, you have to um, find uh, optimal placement of parentheses so that the total number of uh, floating point multiplications is as small as possible. Now, how many ways can you group uh, um, matrices uh, uh, to produce uh, unambiguously uh, red term? So how many ways can you, what is the total number of matrices grouping equal? Uh, this is obviously equal to the number of binary trees uh, with n leaves, right? The leaves will be the matrices, and then intermediate nodes uh, give you a key how uh, the matrices are uh, paired, right, to perform the multiplication. And how big is then the total number of placement of uh, brackets? How many binary trees with n leaves do we have? Well, it's hard to compute it explicitly, but it's relatively easy to bound, to, to estimate the asymptotic. Uh, how do we do that? Well, let's call Tn the number of placement of brackets if you have n terms, if you have n leaves, right, n matrices. Then how is Tn recursively related to uh, smaller, uh, T of smaller values. Well, you have choice where the principal operation will be, where the root of the tree will be, right? You can take any I many elements uh, uh, from the left and then the, the right uh, place the op uh, operation between and then continue with the rest, right? But the total number of, uh, uh, of placement for the first i term is ti, and for the remainder is likewise ti minus one. And because the placement of brackets uh, is independent, uh, you can do it independently for the left half and in, for independently from the right half, then uh, the total number of placements is, of course, the product. So whatever is the number of uh, binary trees we then leave, uh, it has to satisfy this uh, recurrence. And it's easy to see that the solution to this, by the way, these numbers are important in combinatorics. They are called Catalan numbers. 
And it's easy to show that they actually grow faster than uh, um, exponential. Uh, you can prove that uh, this is indeed omega of uh, 2n, 2 to the n, by simple uh, induction by replacing, sh showing that 2 to the i uh, times 2 to the n minus i, of course, this will be just 2 to the n, n times 2 to the n, all of the... Um, uh, and this is, of course, bigger than 2 to the n plus 1 significantly bigger. So it's easy to see that this is true, so there is no way that you can do a exhaustive search, okay? So now we have to find a feasible way how to decide where to place the brackets. And this is where dynamic programming comes into play. Uh, the sub-problems that we consider. Now, you see, this is a very nice example of something that looks like a 2D dynamic programming problem, even though it's actually reducible to 1D. Uh, you see, it doesn't help to determine optimally, just say, optimal solution for the initial part of the chain, right? Because you have then no control of the right-hand side, right? So the problems that you have to solve are indexed by starting matrix and ending matrix. So we will find optimal solution, optimal solutions P, I, J, where I is smaller than J, that represent optimal placement of brackets for the subchain between i place, i matrix, and J matrix. So this does sound as a 2D problem. It's tempting to see it as a 2D problem, but uh, we will see, in fact, it's, uh, it's 1D if you uh, break it down in a good way. So let's see how we do that. How do we actually um, um, group the sub-problems. All of these sub-problems, rather than ordering them lexicographically or in any other way, we will do partial ordering on the basis with respect to how big J minus I is. Okay? So, um, this is, uh, uh, what is it? It's, uh, one less than the length of the chain, right? Because here you have j minus i plus one is the length of the chain. Now, uh, why is this so? Well, recursion proceeds as follows. Uh, um, you uh, simply do an exhaustive search, right, by breaking your chain that you want to find in all possible ways. What are the ways? The ways is take just AI by itself and group AI plus one all the way up to AJ as the right-hand side of the principal product operation. Then the second option is take AI and AI plus one and then uh, group AI plus two all the way up to AJ as the second, as the second operand, right? Then you also consider AI, AI plus one, AI plus two, and you group AI plus three all the way to AJ. So it's an exhausting, exhaustive search. Now, but you see the recursion the whole recursion is not exhaustive because as we've shown, uh, the number of uh, how, in how many ways you can place parentheses is exponential. But here the trick is that once I break the matrices, uh, uh, once I decide where the principal operation is, uh, then this optimal placement for the left chain and optimal placement for the right chain are already in the table. Why are they in the table? So 
the, the table will be, uh, will have um, how many n minus one slots. In the first slot will be just, um, okay, so, so you will have a table that will contain in the same slot lots of um, uh, lots of uh, optimal solutions, right? So you, here you will have optimal solutions for a i up to a k, and the slot will be k minus i slot, right? Now if I if I am looking for optimal solution to this problem, I will consider all of the following subproblems. AI and then the, uh, times AI plus one all the way to, oh sorry, I'm now confusing. Let's, let's call this J. I don't know what, num what did I use. Uh, i and j, yes, right? So up to i, j. Now, this is of length one, right? This here is of length one smaller than the whole chain, so it will be found in this slot. So optimal solution for this will be found in this slot. Optimal solution for this trivial case will be found in the first slot, right? Then if I break down as uh, AI, AI plus one times, so this is the principal operation, and then here AI plus two, all the way AIJ, well, optimal solution for that will be found in the second slot. So this is slot two, right, because the length of the chain is two, the, and the le of optimal solution for this one will be found in this slot, right? So as you range by essentially brute force search how to place the primary, the principal operation, uh, you do exhaustive search for this optimal K, where to place the uh, the uh, principal operation, but notice uh, this AI up to AK will m appear a large number of times. It, it appears for this subproblem, also for subproblem AK plus one, all the way up to AJ plus one or AJ plus two. And so the optimal solution for this chain is being reused. You compute it once store it in the table, so you see the table will have large number of optimal solutions for all cases that the length of the chain is the same, right? So you simply go the longest chain that you can have is of size n minus one, right? Where to place the principal operation. So, yes. Okay, so this is how the table is built. The table, is, so what is the table? Uh, let me elevate it. Uh, you see, for example, in the first slot, right, will be, uh, Okay, so if you have only one matrix, there are no operations that you can do with just one matrix to multiply. You need only at least two. So we can start actually from, uh, say, chain of length two, chain of length three. Here will be chain of length M and so forth. What will be here? Here will be optimal solutions for a1, 
A2, then for A2, A3, optimal solution for A3, A4, all the way to optimal solution A n minus Y A n. What are their optimal solutions? Well, you have only one multiplication, so there is no, you have no choice but just to compute the product. So optimal solution is whatever many multiplications is needed to multiply these uh, two matrices. Uh, now you do it for the chains of length three, right? So here you will have optimal solution for A1, A2, A3, optimal solution for A2, A3, A4, and so forth. Now here, optimal solution for this guy will be either A1, A2 times A3, or it will be A1 times, and then first you multiply A2, A3, whichever takes fewer steps. Now if you have here a chain of length M, so this would be say AI, AI plus one, all the way to AI plus M minus one, right? If the chain is of length M, we start with zero. So if you go up to M minus one, this is length M. What is the optimal solution for this chain? You have to examine the following. Uh, you have to examine uh, first AI, you have nothing to compute there, but then you have the product AI plus one up to AI plus M minus one. Now, optimal solution for this, because the chain is shorter, will be found in this slot. So optimal solution for that will be found in this very slot, which is M minus one, right? Then you have to try AI, AI plus one times AI plus two all the way to AI plus M minus one, right? Now I have to look up two things. Well, here optimal solution is again just multiply these two. But here, this optimal solution can, so the optimal solution for this is here, somewhere here. Optimal solution for this one will be in the slot M minus two. So this will be in the second slot, this will be in the slot M minus two, but the thing is, as I range with my K, so here K is equal I plus one, and the very end, I'll have AI times everything up to AI uh, plus M minus two times AI plus M minus one. Now, this guy will be found in just slot one above, right? And you find whatever is the best of these. So you find the minimum of uh, how many multiplications you need to do to compute um, the corresponding parts. How do we compute uh, the number of multiplications? Well, that's uh, very simple. If you have, uh, if you performed uh, two partial multiplications, so this is for the chain from AI to AK, right? Uh, and this is from S, from AK all the way to uh, I minus one. So if you multiply these two guys, uh, you will do SK many multiplication for each entry here. But this is of size SI minus one times SJ, right? Uh, times SK, so this gives you uh, so these are S's are the size of the, cor the corresponding matrix, right? Um, so using this, you know by recursion how many multiplications to get this. 
and by recursion how many multiplications to get that. So you sum up these two numbers and to this you add that because that's the cost of multiplying left side by the right side, right? So here is the uh, recursion. So it's mean of the work to compute the product of first uh, matrices from the left-hand side, right, from I to K, plus the work to multiply matrices from K plus first to uh, the J matrix, and lo and behold, you get um, this uh, product, uh, uh, right, uh, uh, I mean, plus this, which is to multiply uh, this side by, uh, right, the product of the uh, first, of the left-hand side times uh, the product of the right-hand side, right? So this is what you add, right? When you do, uh, you see, you know by recursion how much, uh, mul how many multiplications to get these. And you know how many multiplications to get that. But on some of these, you have to add the cost of multiplying the uh, resulting matrix here. I called it L for the left matrix, right? So this is matrix L and this is matrix R. So I look up in the table this for this. I look up in my table for that. But then I have to multiply the the result, resulting matrix here with resulting matrix here. Well, the size of matrix AI, the height is uh, SI minus one, the width is uh, SI, right? And uh, uh, similarly for other matrices, so you know that uh, the, uh, this will be the uh, number of multiplications to multiply this side by that side after you found the number of multiplications for this and for that. And you take mean, right? Now notice, uh, and uh, in fact students start confusing that dynamic programming is just brute force. Well, it is not. It sometimes kind of looks, <laughs> sorry? It's a, that's very good expression systematic brute force, uh, brute force in which uh, you uh, do not repeat. Um, every calculation is performed only once. So the search part for optimal solution for every subproblem is by brute force. But uh, uh, this is only for the recursion step because the solution for smaller problems have been recorded in the table already. So that's a very nice example <coughs> of, uh, of course you could do this as a 2D, <coughs> excuse me, 2D problem, um, but, uh, um, um, so if you do it as a 2D problem, say, um, if you form a matrix that looks, if you form a table, um, where is the eraser? So if you form a, a two-dimensional table, it's not a mistake, you know, it's a, Maybe it's even easier to implement and to keep track of things if you, uh, so. This is a table, two dimensional table, and here, right? Uh, you want to find solution that sits here where this is all the way up to I, so from one to I, and this is from one to J, right? And in, at the end you have um, how big can be 
I and J, well, it's actually more of a triangular, so it's not complete table because sum of left and right is equal to, so actually it would be triangular table, right? Because um, left side is always smaller than the right side, so let's draw a triangular table. So it will look something like that, right? Only, only this side will be, uh, so this will be J, and this will be, uh, so, this will, so this is J, and this is I here, right? And you have the values here. So to, co to find, for example, the number that sits here, right? you would have to consider all possible breakdowns, right? Where uh, there will be uh, how many i, so j minus i minus one ways to split. So you will have to, inf to consult uh, k many values because k can range from uh, uh, i plus one uh, to smaller or equal than j, right? How many ways to split? So for each k, you will have to consult two cells, uh, uh, previously computed cells, to find the solution for the chain. Uh, so you will need entry, say, in i uh, k, that's Always, and uh, here you will need the entry in the cell k plus 1 j. So for each possible value of k, you will have to consult two cells, two cells in, in which this difference is smaller than the difference above. Right? So, but uh, of course, uh, because only the number, the cardinality of the chain really matters, because whenever you splice, a uh, string into two, both halves have strictly smaller, smaller length. So actually you don't have to do it as a two-dimensional table. Okay, so this is really kind of pretty typical example. Let's make now a short break and then we will do another very important problem, longest, yes. Oh, this is only... <laughs> Old age, sorry about that. We continue on Wednesday. <laughs>